Our focal text this morning will be verse 3, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, but this morning, Brother Doug just covered one verse. And uh, I'm going to be doing good and really feel insufficient to cover one word uh, this morning as we are together. I want to introduce the first word of this, the greatest sermon, as it is the intro to the Beatitudes, which in itself is the intro to the greatest sermon ever preached. So we're going to look at one word this morning, but we're going to get a running start into it. Um, so if you have your Bibles, if you would stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. I'm going to begin our reading in chapter 4, verse 18. And then I'm going to read, I'm sorry, um, verse 23, chapter 4, verse 23. And then I'm going to read down through Matthew chapter 5, verse 12. Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. And Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, it is our prayer today as we sung that you would open our hearts to receive your wonderful word. Lord, that you would teach us today as we study your word and the words of this great sermon preached by your wonderful Son. Lord, open our hearts now to receive, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. I foolishly began my intro by saying we were going to talk about three words, and the further I got into preparation, the more I realized I could only get through one, right? Because Jessica always teaches me to take what I plan to teach and cut it in half, and then cut it in half again, right? So uh, that's what I have done uh, this morning as we are going to look at just one word. But this word, this very first word of the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever preached, is so very important that we understand this word as number one, you see here that it's repeated over and over and over again. Blessed. That's the word. Makarios in Greek is the word. Blessed. What does this word mean? 
Now, the setting of this sermon is so beautiful. We'll talk about the historical setting in a few moments. But Jessica and I were uh, uh, blessed, happy to go to Israel in February. Perfect timing, right? Just in time. And we got to go there to the, uh, the, the mountain, the sermon on uh, where this sermon was preached. And it was uh, just such a beautiful scene, except for one thing. And I complain about it every time. It's the dang banana trees, right? There, where the Sermon on the Mount took place is this beautiful, it's, a, it's a, a really steep hill. It makes a natural amphitheater. The people would have sat between Jesus on top of the hill and on this grassy uh, hill that goes down to the Sea of Galilee, the backdrop of this sermon would have been the beautiful Sea of Galilee. And now, when you go there, you try to picture it because all you can see is banana trees, right? But it is a beautiful place, except for the dang banana trees. And to me, banana trees are one of the ugliest trees on the planet, right? Anyway, that's, that's beside the point. But Jesus would sit down a place of authority when, when their preachers in that day would preach, they would sit down. Today, the preacher comes and what do we do? We stand up. But that's why the Bible says he sat down and with all of this anticipation, and we're going to see that in a moment, all of the he had been doing, we read about all of the healing, all of the teaching, all of the pro, uh, pronouncing the gospel of the kingdom. And people are following him from everywhere. And there's this huge crowd. Jesus goes to the top of this mountain, sits down, and everyone is waiting to see what he is going to say. This greatest sermon ever preached what's the first word the first word is this blessed blessings makarios i want to talk to us about this word this morning it means happy did you know that it means happy blessed is not a word that we use all the time correct we rarely say oh man that was a blessed time Right? We don't use this word all, but it's not a super spiritual word. It's a human word. It means happy. So it's perfectly okay and accurate to read the introduction to this sermon this way Happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Happy are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Happy are the gentle. For they shall inherit the earth. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Happy, happy, happy. Now we say, that just don't sound right. Right? I like the sound of blessed better. Somehow along the way as Christians... That we have come to think that there is a difference between blessed and happy, right? We've given happy a bad name. And, and reformed Christians are at the lead of this. They have the worst rap. Do you know that? Have you ever, you know, someone finds out that you have reformed theology? What do they think? Huh? The chosen frozen. I forgot about that phrase. Right? There's a guy that uh, lived in the turn of the century, the 1900s, his name was H.L. Mencken, and he defined Puritanism or Reformed theology this way, as the haunting fear that someone, somewhere, may be happy. <laughs> That's the way he defined Reformed theology, right? And that is a, a, such an inaccurate view of the people of God. And it's an inaccurate portrayal of what the scriptures teach. When Jesus said blessed, our translation, it was their word for happy. It means happy. 
It's not being faithful to the scriptures to run away from the word happy. You know, one of my kids one time said this, and we quote it all the time. It's just something that a child says that just catches you off guard, right? They can say things in a way that, that will make us think, right? And one of them, they were just little, and we were doing something super fun, and they just said, you know what? I like doing fun things. And I thought about it, and he said, you know what? I do too, right? I like doing fun things. You know what? It's okay as a Christian to be happy. I like to be happy. You know what? Now that I think about it, I like to be happy. It's not faithful to the scriptures to run from this word happy. See, somewhere along the way, there's become a false dichotomy. That happiness comes from the world and is fleeting. Right? You know what I'm going to say. Because you've been taught it. But joy. <laughs> joy is something better. Joy is from God and lasts forever. Have you been taught that? Happiness is from the world and it's fleeting. Joy is what Christians have. We don't have happy. Dear friends, that is not what the Bible teaches. Dear friends, understand this. The scriptures teach this, that every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Every good thing that comes into our lives is from our Father. Amen. Joy is from God. And I'm not going to you know, defend happy and slam joy. It's good too. You know what? I like joy. <laughs> You know what? I like happy. That's what this word is. Joy comes from God. Happiness is from God. Every good thing comes from God. That is what the Bible teaches. To Him be the glory. You know, I'm going to give you a little homework assignment. The next time you just find yourselves smiling or laughing, lighthearted, having fun. The next time that happens that you're just smiling and laughing and you can't help it, I want you to become contemplative. And I want you to really think about that moment. And I want you to determine if you're joyous or if you're just happy. No, you know what is the better assignment? The next time you find yourself smiling and laughing, thank God from whom all blessings come. Right? Thank God from whom every blessing comes. Every good and perfect thing is from Him. Be grateful. Enjoy every good thing that He gives you and give Him praise. It's easy these days to see the mess of the world around us. To see our society in this swirl that I call the toilet bowl just going deeper and deeper and deeper into the toilet. Right? That's where we are. We need to remember as God's people, and we remember at this time of year, that one of the very first things that flushes that toilet is ingratitude. That God has showed himself to us and we are not thankful. The next time you have something to be happy about, be grateful for it. Embrace it. Thank God for the good gifts that he has given us. Thank him for those wonderful blessings that he brings into our lives. No matter what it is. Don't worry about trying to sort it out. Is this joy? Is this happy? I don't know. It's good. Thank God for it, right? 
My wife did a post last night about me because yesterday I had a day off. And I went and bought chickens. And just like Jace Robertson, chip, chickens make me happy, happy, happy. Right? I enjoy them. They, I find enjoyment in having chickens. And I also got to smoke meats on my smoker. You know what? I enjoy that. And I was just smiling away last night. Got my chickens. Had me a little smoked meat. Thank God for the blessings in your life. It's a beautiful thing that the things that make me happy, maybe, you know, you're like, oh, big deal chickens, right? But there's something in your life, God has made you in such a wonderful and unique way, that there's something that when it happens, you find yourself smiling and laughing and enjoying and you can't help yourself. When that happens, give God all the praise. Amen. For these good things in our lives. Now that's the first part of this. Happy. It really does mean happy. Happy are those who are poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Before we continue on. To rightly understand this very first word of the Beatitudes. The very first word in introduction to the Sermon on the Mount. We need to do a little bit of work. Because I think um, we need to understand how the original hearers would have heard this first word. When they were seated on, sitting on that, uh, that grassy hill with the, the, the Sea of Galilee to their backs, looking up that hill and seeing this, this great new teacher, this miracle worker, all of the buzz, wondering what it was he was going to teach in anticipation. And they were waiting and waiting. And when they heard those first words, what did they hear? It might not be what we think. So to understand, we need to kind of go way back to Moses and to the Old Covenant. Actually, Brother Doug mentioned this passage this morning. If you have your Bible, turn way back to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, we have a summary of the Old Covenant, the Old Deal. It was an if-then covenant, right? And we mentioned this, if you do this, then God will do that. If his people do this, then God will do that. We'll spell it out for you. If you obey God, he would say to his people, then you will be blessed. You will be a happy people. You will have a lot to smile about. You will have a lot to rejoice about. You will have laughter in your hearts. If you obey God, then you will be blessed. We see that in verses 1 through 14. This is kind of the, the Beatitudes of the Old Testament. Look at it with me in Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning in verse 1. And I'm just going to read down to verse 14. Now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you uh, um, if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall you be, shall be the offspring of your body, and the produce of your ground, and the offspring of your beast, and the increase of your herd, and the young of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall, be, uh, shall you be when you come in, and blessed shall you be when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and will flee before you seven ways. 
The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to. And he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself as he swore to you. If you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord and they will be afraid of you. The Lord will make you abound in prosperity in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your beast and the produce of your ground in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers to give you. The Lord will open for you his good storehouse, the heavens, to give rain to your land in its season and to bless all the work of your hand. And you shall lend to many nations, but you shall not borrow. The Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you only will be above and you will not be underneath. If you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, which I charge you to today, to observe them carefully and do not turn aside from any of the words which I command you today to the right or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. Did you hear all the ways, the many ways that God described the blessings that he wanted to pour on his people? So many different ways. He is so good. But the other half of this is the curses. But if you do not obey, you will be cursed. We see those in verses 15 through 68. And I won't take the time to read all of them. But just to give you a flavor, starting in verse 15. Verse 15. But it shall come about if you do not obey the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with uh, which I charge you today that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the country. Cursed shall you be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed you will be when you go out. <clears throat> the Lord will send upon you curses, confusion and rebuke in all you undertake to do until you are destroyed and until you perish quickly on account of the evil of your deeds because you have forsaken me. Does that verse sound familiar? The curse of God is confusion and rebuke cursing in everything you undertake to do until you are destroyed and you will perish quickly because of your evil deeds. The Lord will make the pestilence cling to you until he has consumed you from the land where you are entering to possess it. The Lord will smite you with consumption and with fever and with inflammation and with fiery heat and with the sword and with blight and with mildew and they will pursue you until you perish. And it goes on and on and on. And the thread of curses is even longer uh, than his uh, proclamation of blessing. This was the old covenant. And which way, which way did it go? Right? As we think about the history of God's people, which way did it go? The way of curse. They chose the curse 
of God. If you remember, they would not obey Him. They continued to seek after other gods. God would send one prophet after another to warn them, to proclaim His word, to call them back to Himself. And did they listen to them? No, they would kill them and mistreat them time and time again and they continued in disobedience. We know that even eventually the northern kingdom would be taken into exile by Assyria. They would be cursed. And as Jeremiah would say in his prophecies, do you think that because uh, uh, the northern kingdom, that sister was cursed, that the, the other sister would listen? That it would get their attention? Do you think it got the southern kingdom's attention? No. She didn't learn from her other sister. The southern kingdom didn't learn anything. In fact, became more wicked. They did not learn from her sister's doom. And the southern kingdom is then carried away into exile by Babylon. And all the land is cursed. Then what happened? From the time of the exile until the time of the New Testament, Israel as a nation was nothing more than an old stump in the ground. That's the way the Bible describes Israel. A sad, I mean, just think about a stump. Anybody had a, a tree that you just loved? It brought you happiness? It's just the beauty, the shade. You enjoyed that tree in your yard. And then something happened to it, right? It died. It got sick, it got struck by lightning. Something happened, it had to be cut down. And there in the middle of your yard, where was once the the crowning beauty of your yard, is what? A stump. A painful reminder of something that was once great and strong and beautiful and fruitful. and, And you enjoyed it so. And now that dang stump is nothing but a reminder of what you no longer have. The Bible in Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1 describes Israel as nothing more than a stump. That's all it is. It says it this way, a shoot will spring. Now that's good news because that's Jesus, right? A shoot will spring. But here's the bad news. What's the description of God's people? A shoot will spring from the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Israel is nothing more than a dead stump. Just a sad reminder of what it once was. Of the blessing that they once enjoyed. Cursed. Dying, rotting, dead. After 70 years of captivity, a remnant returns to Israel. But from that point forward, even into the New Testament times, Israel will only be a little shadow of what they once were, a a sad little stump. They'll continue to live under the thumb of one powerful nation after another. Which is, you know when the Pharisees were wanting to, to counter Jesus and they said, we, we are Abraham's children. We've never served anyone. It's like, what are you talking about? There's only been a few hundred years in your whole existence that you haven't been someone's slave. What are you smoking, Right? They're, one, they're slaves to one group after another. And we come to the New Testament <coughs> and they're under the thumb of Rome. And they hate it. But they can't help it. They're not strong enough to do anything about it. They remain cursed as a nation. Let's continue to follow the history here. If you have your Bible, go back toward Matthew and right before you get to Matthew is the last Old Testament prophet. Let's look at how the the Old Testament ends. The final words of the Old Testament. 
There's these ominous storm clouds of God's judgment. The, the nation is still threatened always. The nation is not rebuilt. It's not strong. It's nothing like it was. It's nothing compared to the glory of the time during David and Solomon. And then God sends a prophet. The, the remnant has returned from exile. And they struggle the whole time. They struggle to build a wall. They struggle to, to institute temple worship. They struggle to keep things going on. They're barely making it as a nation. And they continue to fall back into sin, right? They continue to disobey God. And God continues to send one prophet after another until the last or second to last Old Testament prophet whose name is Malachi. And Malachi brings his prophecy. Let's look at the very end of Malachi's prophecy. Malachi chapter 4. There are still these ominous storm clouds. Man, they are threatening. It just looks like it could get bad at any moment, right? That's the way they're living under God's judgment. And every once in a while on the prophets, there is this, don't you love it when there's those storm clouds and there's this one beam of sunlight that just breaks through? And it's glorious. In the Old Testament, we see these storm clouds often of God's judgment and His wrath and His curse. They're looming. It could get bad at any moment. And throughout the Old Testament, boom, there's this passage of sunlight that just comes shining down to remind us that God is on His throne and He is good and He is gracious and He is compassionate. And every time that little beam of sunlight shines on His Son. This passage is like that. You see the storm clouds of judgment. They're still looming on his nation. They continue to sin against him. But there comes this ray of sunlight. Listen to it this morning. Malachi chapter 4 beginning in verse 1. For behold, the day is coming. Burning like a furnace. And all the arrogant and every evildoer will be chaff, and the day that is coming will set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts. So that I will leave them neither root nor branch. Judgment, storm clouds, it's brewing. But for you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go forth and you will skip about like calves from the stall guess what that is that's happy skipping around like a little calf in the pasture with not a worry in his head it's coming days of blessing are coming the sun will rise again and you will be happy again you will tread down the wicked and they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day which I am preparing, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Here it is, some more hope. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with what? A curse. Understand this, the very last word of the Old Testament is curse. The curse of God. There is hope. But the very last word in the Old Testament is curse. What's uh, in my Bible? It's right across the page. What do you have in your Bible? I have a blank page that says the New Testament. 
Guess what happens on that blank page? God goes silent. For 400 years, God did not send another prophet. 400 years since we've heard a peep out of God. Deafening silence. Terrifying silence. Has God abandoned his people finally? No. Into that silence, turn the page again, comes the book of Matthew. And God sends not just any prophet, but the prophet, the greatest Old Testament prophet, the one that would prepare the way for his son. He sends John into this silence. Can you, can you see the anticipation that was happening? What, what is God doing? What is happening? What has happened to us? And then God speaks. He sends us not just any prophet, but the prophet Elijah. Look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 9 through 13. As they were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus commanded, remember it's Peter and James and John, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man has risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, what, if, if all this is coming to an end here, and that's what Jesus is telling them, if, if your public ministry is coming to an end, We've missed something. We, 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 and of course they missed a lot, right? His disciples did. We were missing something here. It seems like there's a piece that's not, not fulfilled. And they said, that's why they asked this question. His disciple asked him, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? We seem to be missing something here. And Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. They are correct. Elijah must come first and then the son. But I say to you that Elijah already came and they did not recognize him. But they did to him whatever they wished. So also the son of man is going to suffer at their hands. Verse 13, then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. Now go back to Matthew chapter 11. Do you remember when John the Baptist had this moment of doubt and he sent two of his disciples and he asked Jesus a question. He was having a, a horrible season of doubt. He said, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did I get this wrong? Because, see, we understood that the Messiah would come in as a military and political leader and that the Messiah would ride into Jerusalem on a white horse and he would send Rome packing back to Italy, right? Where they belong. And he would set up his earthly kingdom and rule from Jerusalem. That's what we understand is supposed to happen and you're not doing it. John himself said, did I get it wrong? Should we expect someone else? What did Jesus say to John? He said, Look at what I'm doing. I am fulfilling scripture. You are right. What you don't understand and what the first century did not understand is that, that, that Jesus would first come as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And that there would to be two different comings. The second time he would come as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And so in the first century, everyone wants the lion, right? Because we hate Rome. Because we've been like servants and we've been cursed for too long. We're ready for the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. We want the lion. 
And Jesus came as the lamb and they rejected him. You, you ever wondered how, why so quickly they went from crying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, laying down the palm branches and saying, here it is, the Messiah is riding into Jerusalem to take over. How just a few days later, they turn on a dime and begin chanting, crucify, crucify, we have no king but Caesar. What happened? He didn't meet their expectations. And they said, oh, he must not be the Messiah. Next. We're done with that one. Next. That's what happened. You see, the first century saw the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And they rejected him because he was not the lion of the tribe of Judah. Dear friends, in our culture today, we are doing exactly the opposite. Our culture today, we want the Lamb of God. We want a God that is gentle, that is okay with things. We don't want a God of judgment. But guess what? Who is coming next? The next time He comes, He comes as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. With wrath and the fury of the righteous and holy God. But that's what's happening in the people. This sense of anticipation. And what did Jesus say about John? Look at verse 7. This is Matthew 11 verse 7. As his disciples, John's disciples were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? A little wimpy dude? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? No, those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written behold i send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before the lord truly i say to you listen to this among those born of women there has not risen anyone greater than john the baptist the greatest old testament prophet and that explains the next phrase yet one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and violent men take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. So, what's happening in the history of Israel? The Old Testament is coming to an end. Something new is coming. Elijah has come. What happens next? People are wondering. There's so much anticipation being built up in this crowd. What comes next? The Son comes next. The Son is rising. And he brings righteousness in his wings. And what, uh, what was the message of John the Baptist? I skipped a, a little bit. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. And I got to hurry. Remember, the people are wondering what's going to happen. What was the message of John? A message of comfort or a message of ju judgment? Message of judgment. You better get ready. He's coming. It's time. That was his message. Look at verse 11. Chapter 3, verse 11. As for me, this is John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
Listen to this. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Message of John the Baptist. So what is happening? God has been silent all of this time. What is he doing? Look at the very next words, verse 30, 13. Then Jesus arrived. Those are beautiful words. <laughs> then Jesus arrived. He arrived from Galilee. He's baptized from Jesus. Verse 16, after be, I mean by uh, John the Baptist, after being baptized, verse 16, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were opened. Then Jesus arrived and what? Then heaven was opened. That's what's happening. Heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. Behold, a voice out of the heaven said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What's happening? The Son is here. The Son has arised. Luke, I mean, uh, Hebrews says this, God, after he spoke long ago to the prophets, uh, fathers in the prophets, in many portions and in many ways, in these last days, he has spoken to us in his son. And what's the very first word his son said in his greatest sermon? Blessed. He pronounced blessing on his people. Do you see what a wonderful breath of relief it would be? With all of this buildup, with all of this baggage, with all of this curse, the curse is all we've known. My grandpa, he only knew the curse. My great grandpa, my great great grandpa, all we've known is the curse. Now God has sent His Son. And what does He pronounce on us? Blessing. Blessed are you. This blessing belongs to His people. This blessing belongs to us. He has pronounced on us the way of blessing the way of happiness. What a wonderful word. To those who are cursed in their sin, Jesus proclaims blessing. And this blessing is in him. You see, we're going to find out as we, as I study this sometime in the future, I'll come back to this. It's a confusing thing for them to hear. What a relief to hear blessing from God. But just like so many things that God says, it doesn't make sense. Right? Blessed are the poor. And this means more than just poor. This means destitute, impoverished, bankruptly, bankrupt. But not monetarily so. Blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt. Those who are cursed. You see, on our own, all we will ever experience is the curse. That's it. That's all we got. But then, Jesus arrived. Right? And what did he pronounce on us? Blessing. Be blessed. Let's thank the Lord for his grace and his mercy in his wonderful son. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. 
Lord, it's my prayer that I've helped us to understand the deep, deep riches of this one word, blessed. And Lord, we remember today that all we know is curse. We have sinned against you. We have fallen short of your glory. And all we know is the curse. But then you sent your son. And in Christ, we have forgiveness of sins, redemption. He paid the price for our sin that we might not have to that we might be blessed. Lord, help us to know the beauty and the riches and the depth of this grace that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, teach us now as we reflect on these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.